What's up, Transformation Church? I'm so excited that you joined us for church today, and we have made it to fun month at Transformation Church. Listen, as me and Pastor Natalie are on sabbatical right now, getting rest and rejuvenated, thinking about all God has done and really preparing for all that God is about to do, you know I wouldn't leave you without something hot and spicy to bring you revelation. And today, I'm telling you, you are in for a treat. This is Throwback Sunday, so we're about to throw it back to somebody who came last year who is me and Pastor Natalie's sister. She is a person that I call Jenny from the block. She is a Latina fireball. When we see each other, we greet each other like this. That's how we do. She is the lead pastor along with her husband, Matthew, of the Father House OC. And today she's about to bring a word. So I want you to get excited and welcome to Transformation Church, Miss Bianca Ota. Good morning, Transformation Church. Welcome, Transformation Nation. It is a good day to be in the house of God. Not only is it fun month, church, church, y'all ain't ready. It is actually throwback Sunday. Why? Because I was here last year for fun month. Homegirl just brings the fun, okay? And I'm so excited to be with so many new faces from different places here in the house of God. And if I can say this to those watching online, part of the TC family, I'm gonna give a little shout out because today is a double dip. It's a double dip, okay? And it's always good when it's double because our home church, my husband and I, Matt, we have a, a home church called the Father's House in Orange County. And guess what? It's a cross between TC and TFHOC. Come through. Thank you, Jesus. So it is going to be a good day to be in the house of God. Now, listen, uh, Pastor Mike is on sabbatical. Some of y'all are like, I wish Pastor Mike was here. I'm just watching for him. Guess what? Um, we are going to bless him with a little sabbatical. So he gets a little break. He gets some time off. He gets to rejuvenate. But this is what I want. I want to take a pause to take a beat. Will you pop in on his social media? Will you leave a comment in the chat box? Will you just let him know, him and Pastor Natalie and the entire TC crew that makes church happen week in and week out. Can you say thank you to them? Can you say that we love you, that we're so grateful for you? Yes, that's what we do. Now, it is my second time here at TC. And uh, since it's my, it's my second time back, it's high time that we get to know each other, okay? We family. If you know anything about me, you know that I am obsessed with Hebrew history and Jewish culture, okay? Like this is something that since I was a child, I've been obsessed with. And I think that this is rooted probably in some childhood pain, but we don't need to go there. Let me just tell you why I'm obsessed with Hebrew history and culture. Well, I grew up in the hood, I grew up in the ghetto. Uh, my, my parents were immigrants to this country. I was illiterate at the age of 12 and I had big, thick Coke bottle glasses. Uh, I was homeschooled and again, I was illiterate. I, and throw that to the mix, I was also obese and so I was special and not in a good way, okay? That's just a blessed Jesus right there. But I remember feeling unchosen, unseen, unwanted, and really wanting and believing God to do something in my life. And I walked into Sunday school and we had a teacher. His name was Mr. Charles. Ooh, Mr. Charles was a preacher from the South and this man had skin like dark chocolate. Mm. He had a voice as, 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 as thick as molasses. His accent was as thick as molasses and his voice was as sweet as sweet tea. And when Mr. Charles opened up the word of God, it was alive, it was active, it was sharper than any two-edged sword. And this is how we know he's a G, okay? Because you are a real G if you take a group of fifth graders through the book of Exodus. I mean, that's when you a G right there, okay? And he took our class in the book of Exodus and he spoke about a people group, God's chosen people. God's chosen people, the Jews that he was speaking to. I, Mr. Charles spoke about them and he said that God, out of all the other people groups in the world, God chose the Jews. Well, as a child who's always wrestled with, with feeling chosen, I began to just wish and hope and pray and say, please, Jesus, please, Jesus, make me a Jew. And then I found out that the color of my skin and the width of my thighs, my Mexican heritage could not be denied, okay? And so I began to pray a better prayer. I said, please, God, please, God, let me marry a Jew so my children will be chosen, all right? But then my theology corrected. And as I matured and I grew, I realized that I have been grafted in like a wild olive branch into the family of God and God has chosen me from the foundations of the world. Praise the Lord. 
But let me tell you something. <laughs> my husband and I were doing some ministry work in London. We touched down at Heathrow International Airport and he was at the baggage claim getting his luggage. And I turned on my phone and there was an influx of text messages. And one of them was from my mom. My mom had texted me and all my siblings and uh, she had said, hey, I submitted my uh, DNA to Ancestry.com and let me show you the results. Well, this is really exciting. So this is my Puerto Rican mom. And so the largest percentage was Spanish or Iberian. But then we found out that my mom was 15% British. I'm in London, I'm with my people. I'm like, hello, governor, would you like a spot of tea? Love to have a little chat, chat with the queen. I'm like feeling it, right? And then, and then get this, get this. My mom is 16% Sudanese. What up, Wakanda, ha, all right? Like, I, I mean, I was feeling it. And then my eyes landed on the most divine information I have ever seen in my life. Let me catch my breath. <laughs> my mom is 1% Jew. I turned to my husband who's at the luggage carousel and I said, Baruka Baba Shem Adonai, baby. I am not speaking in tongues. I'm speaking Hebrew because I am a Jew. I am half a percent Jew. I am Jew-ish, okay? So as a resident Jew of the house, today we're gonna be talking about a man whose name is Yeshua. He's a family member of mine and don't be jealous because I'm a Jew. But let me tell you something. His name is Yeshua, but you might know him as Jesus. So as we open up the word of God, you have a bona fide Jewess in the house teaching you the word of God. Can I get a great amen for that? Now, I want you to grab your Bibles and open them up to the book of Mark. We are gonna be spending time in Mark 14. And if you're the note-taking type, pull out your notebook, pull out your journal, pull out your pen. And I want you to write down the title of today's sermon. And that is Pressed and Purposed. Turning our trials into testimonies. Why? Because our purpose will come out of those pressing moments of life. Where does this take place? The place of pressing. Join me in Mark 14:32. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John, note that if you're taking note, along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, this hour might pass from him. Verse 36, Abba, which means daddy, father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. I want us to hone in on that. Yet, not what I will, what you will. Let's pray as we open up the word of God. Spirit of the living God, we invite you into this space and into this place and we say thank you. Thank you, God, of the work that you did on the cross. Thank you, God, that you remained in the pressing. And my prayer today, Lord, is that it's less of me and more of you. It's less of me and more of you. So God, in this moment, may we utter the words of Jesus, not my will, but yours. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen, amen. Hey, we find ourselves in a very particular place, according to this text. In verse 35, we find Jesus where? We find him in the garden of Gethsemane. What I love about this is today through the power of God's word, we are transported to a different place. No, you are not in Tulsa. You are not in Orange County. You're not in your living room in London. You're not in your bathroom in Baltimore. You know where you are? You are in the darkness of a sad night. The night sky is bruised and beaten, but it's illuminated with stars. And Jesus, we find Jesus, go there in the theater of your mind. Go there in the theater of your mind. Jesus is hunkered down low with the weight of the world's sin on his shoulders. And where do we see him in the garden of Gethsemane. You know what I love about this passage is that we serve a good God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We serve a good God who empathizes with our pain, who knows our fear, our worry and anxiety. And today, if you came to church and you were wondering, I don't know if this word's gonna be for me. Listen, you have come to the right place. Maybe you're sitting here, you're thinking like, my life feels oppressed, oppressed, depressed, and I need God. Guess what? You're in the pressing place and you came to a good place. Maybe you're like, there is some power. There is some power planning deep with inside of me. Guess what? You are in the pressing place and that what it presses is gonna come out with a new sense of power. So today, church, 
Today, we find ourselves in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this word Gethsemane is a combination of two Hebrew words, get, shemonin, and it means the place of pressing. So it is here that grapes will be crushed and turned into wine. And it is there that olives will be pressed and turned into oil. Now, the reason why I remember the specific pronunciation of this is because I was 24 years old and I found myself in Israel and I was here in this exact place. And I remember the phrase, get shemonin as get some money, okay? Because y'all, I was in a pressing place. 24 years old, I had to move back home and live with my parents and like, what person wants to do that, you know? So I'm living at home. I'm about to finish grad school. I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. And my mom was diagnosed with not one, but two forms of cancer. One of them was brain cancer. And I just remember feeling so pressed and I didn't have a job, so I remembered it as get some money. Okay, and here in this place, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus say these words, Abba, meaning daddy, everything is possible for you. Take this cup away from me. And here in this pressing place, Jesus is saying, I don't want to do this. Now, I don't know if you've ever paused when you've read this passage, have you ever paused and said, I wonder what cup he's talking about. Is it just me? I don't know. But like when I read this passage, I said, uh-huh, I wonder, is this like a, a Hebrew idiom? Like take this cup from me? I, I, I don't know. What, 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 is, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, some scholars believe uh, that this passage is referred to in the Last Supper. And as a good Jew, let me tell you that Jesus was with the disciples. Prior to this passage, Jesus is with his disciples at uh, the Passover meal. We know this as the Last Supper. And as a good Jew, let me tell you that there are four glasses of wine in the Passover, okay? So church, online, in the room, how many glasses of wine are there at Passover? Four, okay, apparently God's people love a good turn up, okay? So they're out there like just pouring it out for the homies, like praise the Lord, we're here celebrating. And so after this dinner, where do we find Jesus? Jesus is now in the pressing place where olives and grapes are pressed. And Jesus says this word, take this cup from me. And maybe, maybe your pressing place might feel different. Maybe you are not in the Garden of Gethsemane. Maybe you are an entrepreneur whose business feels because of everything that's going on, the economy, your business is going bust. You feel like you're on the brink of bankruptcy and you feel like you are in the pressing place. Or maybe you're the business owner. As I was praying, I said, God, where are your people? You're the business owner who, when you look at your employees' faces, you don't just see their faces, you see the faces of their kids and you feel responsible for their families and that weight is choking you out and you feel pressed. Maybe, maybe you feel like uh, you're in a pressing place because your spouse has walked out on you. Or maybe you're a parent who's so longing to see their child that your child has not only left you, but your child has left God and you are in the pressing place. Maybe, maybe you have gone through every single week of relationship goals with Pastor Mike and you are waiting and you're praying and you just, you, you want more than just the permission. You want the blessing. You, you know, porneia means, I mean, you did all the weeks and you said, I'm gonna make a commitment. I'm gonna say high and right. I'm gonna say pure. I'm gonna say good, God is good. And all of a sudden, all these hot folks are sliding into your DMs and you're like, what am I supposed to do? I feel pressed. Let me give you a loving word, fam. For all the singles in the place, this is a favorite phrase I gave every, give everyone for my lusty, musty, thirsty, and thoughty friends. Let me tell you, they may be hot, but so is hell, all right? When they try to come at you, run away, flee, because that's not from the Lord, okay? You have relationship goals, friend. Do not compromise. If you're taking note, I want you to write this down. Pressing, pressing, the pressing is real. The the, the pressing is rough and the pressing will rival your greatest pain. How do I know this? Because my husband is a level three sommelier. Let me show you a photo of my husband. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He was supposed to come, but there's been some great stuff that's been going on. I'll explain later, but this is my husband. And uh, for all the single ladies, (laughs) don't stare too long because I love Jesus, but I will cut you. (laughs) No, 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 I'm Latina, I'm loyal. Don't, Don't look at him too long, all right? But my husband in this process in the last seven years uh, has studied the best wine growing regions. He has studied uh, the varietals that are there. He's even studied in the most beautiful way, a crucial aspect 
to making wine, and it, you can't have wine unless grapes are pressed. So when Matt, my husband, teaches on John 15, he always talks about the power of why Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the vine, and the importance of that. And not just that Jesus says, I am the vine, but then he goes a step further, and, they, and, and he says that, they are, that his father is the gardener is the vine dresser, is the wine maker. And so both Matt and I have studied this passage and we've taught on that God is doing a new thing in the world. There is a new move of God. There's a revival that is going to break out. And we believe that this is the new wine that the prophets were speaking about. And we see here that God is doing something new and you can't put old wine or excuse me, reverse it. You can't put new wine in old wineskins. That's what the gospels say. And so when we talk about the process, you know, I realized I've always glossed over one aspect of the process because I hate it. So every time I talk about this, I'm always like, nope, cut it, don't wanna talk about that. And this aspect is crucial and it's pressing, the pressing. Why? In the vineyard, the grapes are grown by being attached to the vine. They are attached to the vine for their sustenance. The grapes don't have to do anything. They're chilling like a villain on the vine, getting round and juicy, living their best life. They are attached to the vine. Why? Because the vine is the one doing the work. See, the vine, the roots have to go down deep into the soil. It has to fight for minerals. It has to fight for the nutrients that it needs. It fights for water. In fact, do you know that if the vine had the perfect ingredients, it had the perfect atmosphere, if the vine had everything perfect that it needed, the fruit actually would not be good. But if you stress the vine, if you stress the vine and you make the vine work to go down deep for its nutrients, to go down deep for its water, that the fruit that is produced is beautiful. Now, I believe that this is a word for us. I'm gonna make a case the same is true for us, that it is the struggles and the stresses of life. It is the struggles and stresses of life that produce the greatest harvest. Maybe that is why in John 15, in Mark 14 where we were, but in John 15, similar timeline of what's going on, Jesus has a conversation either on their way to Passover or at Passover when he recounts that he is the vine. And in verse one of John 15, he says, I am the vine and if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. That's John 15 chapter one. Now, but then he says something as he ends the vine wine lesson in chapter 15, verse 16. Don't turn there, it's gonna here on your screen. Let me read it over us. You did not choose me. No, I chose you and appointed you so that you might bear fruit. Ah, hold up. Don't gloss over this. He says fruit that will last. The point isn't to grow fruit. The point is to produce fruit that lasts. Now, if you have grapes and you leave them out, they'll be good for three, four, maybe five days, but if you press them, church, I need you to hear me. If you press them and extract the value that's inside of them so that it comes out, that is producing fruit that will last. I have seen grapes last maybe five days, but I've seen bottles of wine last 60, 70, and 80 years. The biblical way to be preserved, friends, is to be pressed. You can't get around it. And being pressed might feel like your end, but church, let me tell you that it's not. And Paul knew that this was part of the process. When he wrote his second letter to the Corinthians in Corinthians 4, 8 through 9, he says this, we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but you ain't dead, you are not destroyed. The grave's pressing wasn't the end. Church, it was the beginning of the transformation process. It is not your end, church. It is the beginning of your transformation process. This is the beginning of your transformation process, the process leads, the pressing is just to produce fruit. So brothers and sisters in the place with style and grace, let me say this over us, that this pressing isn't going to destroy you. No, what it's doing is that it's extracting the good that is held within you. After the pressing becomes the process, your pressing leads to the transformation process. In John 15, 
Jesus said, I am the vine, and we are back in Mark 14. And where do we see ourselves, church? The pressing place. We serve a God who is not far away. We serve a God who knows our pain. Our God who has prayed prayers very similar to us. Prayers that are like, God, I can't do this. God, this is too much. And he says, take this cup away from me. What cup was he referring to? I mentioned this earlier, but some theologians believe that it is the cup of suffering or the cup of wrath that Isaiah and Jeremiah reference. But in studying, in studying Passover and in studying this passage, you guys, I had, a, I had a great adventure and I want you to go on this detour with me for a second. Um, I'm gonna ask you, you can leave it in the chat box. How many glasses of wine are there at Passover, church? Four. I'm schwitzing already, oy vey. You guys are good Joes. Okay, good. If you answer four in the chat box, yes, the Lord sees you. Extra credit, bonus points for you. Okay, so we know that there are four glasses of wine at the Passover. And with each glass of wine, there is a symbolic passage, a reading, a hymn, a song that is read to remind them of their years of slavery. So I want you to, in Mark 14, just jump up to verse 32 to provide some context. Listen what Mark documents. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Now, check this out. This is the main meal. This is the third cup because it's the unleavened bread that was broken for them. So they are on the third cup. They're eating the Passover lamb at this time. They have the third cup of wine and he's breaking the bread and they're having communion. This is a new covenant. This is a new system. This is a new way. And check this out. I want you to go to verse 26. Verse 26 says this, when they had sung the hymn, it, it, this is the great Hallel. This is the big song. This is the closer. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I need you to catch that. I need you to catch it. They were on the third glass of wine. Did y'all catch that? They were on the third glass of wine. Then they ended it with the song. And then he went to the Mount of Olives. What's missing, church? Do y'all catch that online? If you're real smart, you get extra credit. You put it in the chat box. He missed the fourth glass of wine. Why? I believe that Jesus knew that he was the lamb that was slain the final Passover. And he did not finish that fourth glass of wine until he hung on a cross on Calvary, arms stretched out wide, and he said, it is finished. Until he had his death, we could not have our life. Jesus was pressed down. Jesus was crucified for our sin, for our pain, for our transgressions, for our anxiety, for our fears, for our trespasses. And he said, it is finished. And in the garden at Gethsemane, the pressing place, he says, take this cup of pain, of worry, of anxiety, take this cup from me. Jesus had to be pressed to pursue his purpose and to fulfill his purpose. He had to be poured out. Church, literally his blood was poured out as a living sacrifice for me and for you. He was pressed for his purpose. So write this down fam, purpose. Have you found yourself saying, I can't do this. I can't, it's just, it's too much. I, I, I'm, I'm hit on every side. This pressing is leading to my crushing. God, I can't do this. Will you please take this cup from me? Now, I say that not hypothetically. I say that because I have said those words. A year ago at Fall Month at TC, I came to, to Transformation in our church, the Father's House, Orange County. We were already a few months old. Um, and, and at that point, we had already moved church venues three times. We had moved church venues three times. And the event center that we were in now, um, she was a little busted. We made her beautiful. We pipe and drape, we put in seat covers. It was load in and load out every week. Set up, tear down, set up, tear down, set up, tear down. Shout out to all the church planners out there because y'all feel me right now. Okay. And it 
was trying, it was taxing. In fact, our first week uh, at our new location, our trucks were graffitied and vandalized. We had stuff jacked from it. In addition to stuff being taken from it, we found drug paraphernalia and um, sexual items found in the cab of the truck, okay? So this was kind of like our welcome to the neighborhood sign, maybe, I don't know. Not only were the trucks broken into and stuff stolen and people were shacking up in our truck, Each week we'd roll into church and we would have like no clue of what we were gonna find. We had no clue of what to expect. On one particular week, uh, our early early setup team, the dream team, they're amazing. They'd get there early, they were unloading trucks. Well, there were some two gangsters that decided on the outside of our buildings to kind of step up and be like, where are you from? (laughs) These gangsters were on the outside of church. And I told our dream team, they're lucky it wasn't me, okay? They're lucky it wasn't me. They're lucky they didn't catch me because they were to stand there and be like, where are you from? KOG, kingdom of God, fool. So you either get saved or leave, okay? Bye, Uh uh-uh. You mess with the wrong chick, all right? So those are the gangbangers on the outside of church. But guess what we had going on the inside of church? We got homeless people making their home inside our closets, our utility closets. Oh, Jesus, take the wheel. At the event center that was there, people would roll in and use the vent. And guess what? We would find drug paraphernalia, razor blades, alcohol bottles. Y'all, there was a weave found in one of the rooms. A weave. And I know some of y'all are like, "Mm." What is the weave? It's fake hair, Karen. It's all good. It's all good. But there's just fake hair. I mean, this place was crazy. I mean, listen, listen. My favorite Sunday, my favorite Sunday of all Sundays was I had rolled in on a Sunday. I had a bottle of Lysol in one hand. I had anointing oil in the other. You want to know why, church? Because that week... There was a group, I think you might know them as the Thunder from Down Under, that were there at our church venue. I walked in and there's literally body oil on the floor. I'm over here kneeling down, Lysol, wiping it up, anointing in the name of Jesus from God knows what these jokers were doing on this stage. And I remember praying, God, You had people gyrating and taking off their clothes on this stage. And this is where I got to preach the word of God. God, take this cup from me. Now listen, I want us to be people, even in the midst of the craziness, where we say, press me, God, to bless me, God. God, I believe that this will not break me. This will make me, God. I know that you see me. I know that you're doing a work in me. I know that you are the author and the finisher of my faith. So put a period on this story real quick. Now, we as people, if we say, oh, I'm a follower of Christ, I follow Jesus. Hey, if you follow Jesus, you don't just follow him for your free blessings. You don't just follow him for the miracles. You don't just follow him for the fish and loaves. Nuh-uh, you also follow him to the pressing place. We have to follow Jesus to where he is calling us. And what is the pressing place? The place of the grapes and the olives where their outer flesh, their skin was removed so that what is inside of them their real value would come out. And I declare that your purpose will come out, church, when you are pressed. See, we all want the oil, but we don't want the pressing. We want the anointing, Uh aha, but don't make me pay a price on that. No, when we say, Lord, anoint me, Lord, set me apart, Lord, give me a purpose. You know what you're really praying? You know what you're really praying? Lord, press me. Lord, press me. Press me until all of me is outside of me. Press me until what comes out of me is you. See, but we want the anointing without counting the cost. We all want the oil without paying the price. We want to catch anointing like we catch Rona. Like if Pastor Mike, if you were just rolling right now and you're like, oh, if Pastor Mike could just pray for me, if Pastor Mike could just touch me, if Pastor Mike could just sweat on me, then I'll be able to touch my anointing. No, what you need to do, child, is get on your knees and start pounding the ground and saying, press me, God, press me, God, press me, God. I will do whatever you want to do. I don't want to do this but I will do this. Not my will, but your will be done. And if you can't handle the pressing, Yasufa is done, be done, it's done. If you can't handle the pressing, you can't handle the anointing. See, there is no discount on annoying. There's no clearance cost on your calling. No, 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 there's no anointing without a cost and your anointing is expensive. It's full price plus tax, y'all. And listen, my generation, my generation more than any generation before talks 
about calling, but doesn't count the cost. Talks about anointing and ignores the appointing. Talks about purpose all the time, but we wanna avoid the pressing. No, we've got to say, press me, God, and use me. I, I don't wanna do that, but I will do that. Not my will, your will. And the Bible is full of people who were broke and busted and all of a sudden God blessed them in the sight of society's elite. And society could have looked at them and been like, wait, what? You use them? How would you use those people? No, 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 no. Because God is looking for the Moses who's been on the backside of the desert wandering for years. God is looking for the David who stinks of sheep as he has been with the sheep pen with the sheep. God is looking for the sweaty brow of Ruth's in the field getting their wheat. God is looking for people who are willing to be pressed for their anointing and no one can get your anointing for you. Y'all, you gotta get your anointing yourself. Let me prove this to you. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he tells them, y'all, I'm stressed. I'm so stressed. I'm so stressed. I need you to pray for me. Let's pick this up in Mark 14, 37. He returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, Simon, he said to Peter, why are you sleeping, fool? Are you for real? You're gonna do me like this after everything I've done for you? Or come on, Peter, couldn't you stay watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And guess what? This doesn't happen once or twice. It happens thrice. Three times Jesus rolls up and he's just like, could you not stay awake? Could you not pray for me? Have you ever felt like people are oblivious to your pain? Have you ever wanted to look at someone and say, if you only knew what I was carrying, if you only knew what God has asked of me, you would stay awake. Or maybe you find yourself saying like, these people are sleeping on me. I mean, they, they, they don't even know what I have. They're sleeping on me. Join the ranks of Jesus. The book of Mark and Matthew record that this happened three times, that Jesus went and asked them, can you not pray for me? Look at verse 35. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed. Ooh, scripture says going a little further. That's what I just wanna amen it right there. I want you to pause and amen that because Jesus went a little further. And if you find yourself praying for a breakthrough that hasn't come and you are believing, will you go a little further? If you feel right now where you are like, if God only knew I want intimacy with him, I want to know him, go a little further. If you are believing that the purpose that God has put in your life is still packed inside of you, will you go a little further? Will you hit your knees and pray not once, not twice, but over three times. Because if our Lord and Savior, y'all, if he had to pray three times, what makes us think that we're exempt from that? To fight, God, I wanna be with you. I think, church, I think it's in those moments where we find what we're made out of. When things aren't perfect, when it's hard, when we feel abandoned, there were weeks in the church planning process, I mean, even recently, where my husband and I would have these crazy conversations. Like we are in a global pandemic as church planters. There is civil unrest in the United States. What the heck are we doing? Did we really hear you, God? I mean, it, it, uh, the venue that we were in, the venue we were in, it went bankrupt during coronavirus. We. We had no home. Yo, I, I found myself saying, we're like the wandering tribe of Israel with no home. Actually, at least they had a tabernacle. We didn't even got a tent. Yo, we had nothing. I'm like, oh gosh, we are wandering. We ain't got no home. And I remember uh, Matt and I talking about and saying, is this what God has for us? Should we continue to do this? Because there's people on this side that are like, oh, no one's gonna tell me how to do church. No one can tell me to stay out. No one can tell me to wear a mask. And you know what? If it's not real church, if it's not real church, and I'm not gonna go. And that online stuff, that's not real church. And then we got people on the other side that are like, oh, wait, you don't understand. There's a global pandemic and it's super viral. I mean, it's super contagious and you're absolutely reckless if you have church. And I'm somewhere in the middle like, fix it, Jesus. You, you guys are concerned about whether or not we have church. We ain't even got a church. Like Jesus, show up. Uh-uh, so there's like two sides of this. And I found myself saying, Jesus, take your cup from me. In fact, if we're gonna have some real talk, when Transformation reached out and said, hey, would you cover for Pastor Mike as he's on sabbatical? I looked at the phone. I looked at my husband. 
We were praising Jesus, saying God is good all the time and all the time God is good. You wanna know why? Because we lived another week as church planters, hallelujah. Y'all think I'm joking, no. We hung up the phone and I was like, baby, God's making a way in the desert. There's streams coming through, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And in this moment, I just felt like my praise pants come up and I had to put a praise on it. I'm gonna lose some y'all and I don't care. But Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Some of y'all know that song. You'll know the next lyric. Jehovah Nisi, hey, Lord, you reign in victory. Because in that moment, it felt like we got a victory. God saw us. God has provided for us. And the week to week grind of like, how are we going to do this? Y'all opened up your house. Guess what? Your house became my house. Su casa es mi casa, okay? You guys opened it up. Y'all even gave me some clothes. I got some TC merch. Y'all fed me. I got to preach the word of God. This homeless ratchet church planner is like showing up in Tulsa. Like you don't even know what a blessing y'all have been. And Jesus says in verse 35, take this cup from me but then he followed it up with the most beautiful words in this narrative and dare I say the most beautiful words that we could say yet not what I will but what you will this is where the point pivots I want us to lift up our voices and say but not what I will God what you will see uh, what felt like the oppressor, our enemy, Satan, what felt like the enemy just pushing me down saying, I'm bearing you to kill you because there was moments where I felt that. I can now stand back up and look and say, like the Mexican proverb says, you tried to bury me, but you didn't know I was a seed. My God, I need the church to know that your pressing isn't meant to destroy you. Your pressing is meant to transform you. The pressing is meant to transform you. It is to get the most valuable parts on the inside of you out so that the thin layer of your outside is removed and what is good and what is God and what is gracious comes out. Your pressing is the beginning of your amazing transformation and it will reveal two the world. It will reveal to yourself what God has put on the depths of you. So the question I ask church is, are you willing? Are you willing to stay in the middle of the pain to go through the process so that your purpose is discovered? Are you willing to wait and see the goodness of God in the land of the living? Are you willing? Are you willing to say, God, I will let go of the good because I'm, I want your greatness of you. I want you to magnify yourself in me in the greatest way that only you can. Are you willing, church? I don't say this to preach a point. I don't say this to get an amen. I say this because I've gone through the process again and again and again. It's part of the transformation process. So for all the people that are watching in every time zone, in every country, in every continent, I believe that this is a word for you, but I believe specifically for our TFHOC community in California and online, let me remind you, that you're, per, you're pressing is part of the process. And I'm so honored to tell our online family that God has blown our mind yet again. When I came here last year for Fun Month to Preach at Transformation, I remember leaving so shook about everything that God had done for TC. I mean, I remember thinking like, God, what is going on there is amazing. If you could do it for them, God, you could do it for us. God, the favor that is there, I've seen it with my own eyes. I felt like the spies of Israel that went in to go check out the promised land. And I flew back to California and I was like, yo, the fruit is good in Tulsa. And then, for the five year anniversary of TC, I flew out here to celebrate with y'all what God was doing. Five years of goodness, five years of graciousness. And I walked away saying, God, if you could do it for them, you could do it for us. But you wanna know something, this house is full and led with a man who was full of the spirit of God. And I reached out to Pastor Mike and I said, Pastor Mike, can you just give our church a little word of encouragement in a rough season? Y'all, he sent us such a powerful word. He spoke life into us and he gave us hope for a home. I can't show you the full video, but I'm gonna show you a few seconds of that day and the video that he sent us. Go ahead and check it out.
Hey TFHOC, we are here at Transformation Church for their church building dedication. In just five short years, they were able to acquire a miracle building that you see behind us. We want to document the day and show you what God can do for us, because if God did it for them, He could do it for us. We've been on this journey uh, my entire life, but as a church for the past five years, really believe in God for things that didn't make sense. And I want to encourage you that I feel like that same um, thing that we're doing here, God is doing in your community. But I want to encourage you that what sounds crazy in one season will be counted as faith in another. You stay faithful. If you give what you're supposed to give, if you sow what you're supposed to sow, if you stay faithful even in the hard seasons, one day, that thing that sounded crazy will be counted as faith. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I want to encourage you, what you have thought that God forgot about and that your faith has been waning on, it wasn't a setback, it was a setup. And so I want to encourage you right now, hold on to the faith that got you here and the faith that's going to take you there. Pastor Mike was speaking life over our house. Pastor Mike was saying that God could do what, Matt, what, 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 what the world says is impossible. That God can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask, think, hope, or imagine. And here in Tulsa at Transformation Church, I get to echo the words of my brother, Pastor Mike Todd, and say, we got the keys, the keys, the keys. Because guess what, church? The Father's House, Orange County, has a home. We have a home. God has blessed us with over 50,000 square feet in downtown Brea in Orange County, California. California, a theater that has 10 movie theaters and restaurants all around. So the place that would tell fictitious stories with fictitious characters by movies made in Hollywood, now we get to tell the greatest story ever told. That is a God story. It is a miracle story. This is the stuff that movies are made out of church. God provided in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of our misery, God made a way that God granted us grace in this crazy season and guess what he pressed us as pride of our process because there was a purpose that the word would kind of come out that the word would transform lives that people would identify the leadership gifting in their life that salvation would be found that transformation will be found that marriages will be reunited that children will come back home that dreams will hit fruition that people will step into seasons of blessings after seasons that have felt like deserts if God did it for TC, He could do it for us. The pressing isn't meant to destroy you. It's meant to get the very best out of you. And this isn't just my story. It's your story. Because what God did for TC and what God's doing for us, God wants to do for you. Yeah. If you have lost everything, stay in the pressing. For every scar, that you have every broken heart that has been shattered on the floor, stay in the pressing. For every dollar wasted, dollar invested, dollar earned, stay in the pressing. For every lost relationship, every ache and every pain, stay in the pressing. For every tear shed, every hope and every dread, stay in the pressing. In the words of Jesus, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus modeled this so beautifully. He was betrayed, he was mocked, he was scourged, he was abandoned, he was beaten, and he was crucified, and he was buried. But those were the facts of his past. There was a destiny yet to be held, and on the other side of pain is always resurrection, church. In the pain of the garden, it became power in the tomb. The crucifixion on the cross became the defeat of death. His death brought us life. His broken body became a resurrection for a world in great need. And as Jesus resurrected, guess what? So will we. But church, before we could say press, we've got to say yes. We have to say yes to this man named Jesus. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a miracle worker. Church, I'm begging you to recognize him as our risen Lord and Savior. That when he cried out, 
Daddy, take this cup from me. He said yes for me, and he said yes for you. The weights of the world hung on his shoulders as he was stretched out on a cross on Calvary. And when he said, it is finished, the veil separating God from man tore from top to bottom so that we could have intimate relationship with the God of the universe. He did it for you. He did it for me. Are you ready to say yes? Because when he rose from the grave, there was a promise of new life. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I, I have come to bring you life and life abundant. Do you want that abundant life? Maybe you are hearing about this man named Jesus for the first time. Maybe someone sent you this link or you happen to be scrolling YouTube or Facebook and all of a sudden, poof, there's this crazy big haired Latina that's yelling at you. I just come to bring you a message of hope, life, and transformation in Jesus. Or maybe... Maybe at one point you had a walk with God, but you turned your back on Jesus. This is your opportunity to repent, to turn around and get in closeness with Jesus. So right where you are, whoever you are, in cubicles, in living rooms, in homes, in community groups, in small groups, in big groups, wherever you are in this moment. If you have never said yes to Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or maybe at one point you did, but this is your opportunity to get back, don't waste this time. Jesus is wooing you. He's beckoning you. He said, hey, come here, baby boo. Come here, baby boo. I want you. We're going to pray a prayer of faith, and we don't want you to be alone in this process. There is a number on the screen. We want you to text that number. Why? So we can put resources in your hand, because guess what? You're not isolated and alone. You're not a nappy-headed orphan. You are part of this crazy family, KLG, the kingdom of God, all right? So if that is you, you are saying yes to Jesus for the fourth time or the first time. Today is your opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If this is you, I want you to pray a prayer of blessing. Can you say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Today I choose you as my Lord and my Savior. Give me a new life. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Fill me with the same Spirit that resurrected you from the grave. Put your purpose in me. In Jesus' name, amen. I am believing that there's hands all across the world and we celebrate you and this decision that you made for Jesus. Remember, text us the number. Text the number below because we love you. You are not alone. God's blessings upon you. Thank you, Jesus, for Pastor Mike and Natalie, the entire TC team. We love you. We can't wait to see you online next week.